Namaskar and welcome to the Center for Soft Powers Global Webinar Series Soft Talk 8 Indian Music in Canada. The Center for Soft Power is India's first center that is dedicated to the study of soft power. The center specifically focuses on analysis, advocacy, and awareness in the field of India's cultural heritage globally. The center maps the various elements of India's culture, including yoga, performing arts, Ayurveda, cuisine, craft, design, visual arts, language, literature, spirituality, experiential tourism, sports, Indic knowledge systems, and education. By engaging with practitioners and academics, the video that you just viewed is a production of the center for Yoga Day. It is our honor today to be hosting such an august set of speakers. We are thankful to Sri Ajay Bisaria, the Indian High Commissioner of Canada, for having sent us a message which you can all listen to in a minute. Namaskar. I'm delighted to learn that the Center for Soft Power India is organizing this virtual event to celebrate Indian classical music in Canada. Although the traditions of music in India are ancient, the performance of uh, music encourages innovation and interpretation by the artists. This makes Indian classical music incredibly rich. Like India, Canada is an open and inclusive society. Both embrace diversity. It is very Canadian to celebrate the cultures of the world. We saw recently how Canada enthusiastically took up celebrating the International Yoga Day and it is no surprise that Indian classical music has its rasics in Canada as well. As uh, strategic partners, we consider our cultural relations with Canada to be an important ingredient in our relationship. The 1.6 million strong Indian diaspora in Canada is acted as ambassadors and torchbearers of Indian culture. And we are pleased to see it being appreciated and becoming a part of the popular Canadian culture. We look forward to an enthralling performance and I wish all the artists all the very best. Namaskar. We would like to now introduce our uh, first guest. It is indeed an honor and we, at the outset, I would like to thank all our speakers for having accepted at such short notice to spend their very precious time with us. We have with us today, for a start, Sangeeta Kalanidhi, Sri Trichy Shankaran, a world-renowned percussionist and a professor emeritus, Department of Music, York University, Canada. It is indeed a great achievement that he set up the Department of Indian Music in York University, along with his disciple, John Higgins Barbathar, several, several years ago. Uh, Aparna, I request you to now take over. Namaskaram. Uh, we would like to start off with uh, probably the uh, right at the beginning. And uh, what was the uh, premise upon which you decided to uh, start the department on Indian music? Was your aim to create many more John Higgins Bhagavatars? Or was it to uh, welcome to the world a new generation of musicians? who would continue to play their uh, music, but still have influences of Indian music. Please, could you unmute yourself, sir? Okay. You can hear me now? Yes, sir. All right, okay. Yeah, first of all, um, <clears throat> that was a nice introduction by the High Commissioner. And I watched the video of uh, yoga and dance. Uh, it was so beautiful. It was fantastic. Okay, John Higgins and myself, we were the co-founders of Indian Music Program at York University in Toronto. Uh, it was mentioned that John Higgins was my disciple, Noam. He was not my disciple, he was my colleague. 
I just wanted to clarify that. He was a disciple of uh, Dr. T. Vishwanathan, who used to teach at uh, Wesleyan University. And of course, he is no more. So they, they, they represent the Balasaraswati's uh, dance tradition. <clears throat> so the invitation to come to York University came through John Higgins when I was in India. Uh, I wanted to try it out because I hold a, a master's degree in economics and I had always uh, had a research interest. And also I have uh, taught many of my gurus or students at home as a senior disciple of uh, Palani Subramanya Pillai. And uh, so I had an interest to come and, uh, and, and try it out. Um, so I came at the invitation from the music department to York University not really seeking you know, job abroad or anything. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I remember um, I left India at the pinnacle of my career uh, with the intention of maybe spending one year or two years, but it ended up, as you know, it, the rest is history. Um, in India, of course, we take students who have an aspiration to become performers in their tradition, be it vocal or instrumental or anything. They come with that motive. And as gurus, we also accept students only that way. But after coming here, I assessed the situation at the university and saw that, you know, the students come from various disciplines and it's an academic program and to teach Indian music in an academic, at an academic level was quite different from the Gurukula training I had had with my guru. Because I, have, I was uh, uh, trained in the strict Gurukula system. So I wanted to assess the situation. I also had the same notion of, you know, just to, uh, preparing, you know, students just like uh, John Higgins, who, you know, the, who became a Bhagavata. But that was my intention in the beginning. But soon I found out, you know, you know, I, I, you know I, I should really devise a curriculum that would accommodate the interests of the students and how I can be very helpful to them in my teaching. So that kind of, you know, made me to, to, to create a pedagogy, a system that would accommodate all the interests of the students. And I would say my teaching mainly had been a hybrid system because we come from an oral tradition of India. Whereas here in the West, it's a written tradition. Everything is notated and everything is read and music is performed by, you know, from, from reading from the score. Soon I learned to adapt to the situation and I created a, a, a hybrid system, which I found over the years being very successful. And if you want me to elaborate on that, I can go ahead or else I will just pause here for others to take part. So maybe we'll get back to that uh, if our viewers want a little more on that. Sir. Yes, uh, sure. Let us fast forward to today, sir. And uh, uh, the, probably the most exciting thing for us in India is the collaboration of uh, Indian musicians with uh, jazz musicians in the West. And uh, we, we, we come to know a lot about the similarities between the two genres. But uh, could you talk to us about uh, the differences between uh, Carnatic music and jazz? And how, do, uh, how have you navigated these differences? And what kind of music comes out of this kind of difference? OK, that <clears throat> really pertains to the collaboration and this kind of, you know, what people call the global music or fusion music. Um, yeah. Before that, I would like to just uh, mention that this country, Canada, has been a country of broad range of cultures, diasporas, traditions, and histories. The arts reflect the diverse cultures and the ethnicity in Canada. The common experiences of immigrant cultures have helped and enriched this country, particularly in arts. In transplanting the cultural values of their native traditions, the artists have experienced and maintained different degrees of assimilation, integration, and marginalization. That is experiences of acculturation, so to speak. Okay. 
So this is where we come into play, you know, like uh, how we embrace other traditions. <clears throat> of course, on the one hand, I was deeply concerned with my traditional roots, my traditional music. And then this country really also the ethnic cultures surrounding this country, surrounding this main culture, mainstream culture, offered me opportunities to collaborate with uh, musicians of different disciplines, different genres. I have collaborated with the gamelan ensembles, and I have collaborated with the African drummers, small world music ensembles, and also, you know, in the process, I also became a composer. And uh, so um, we will touch on everything. You were asking about, uh, you know, the differences between Indian music and jazz. Okay. <clears throat> I think it will be interesting to talk about the first experience of the South Indian drumming and jazz. This happened back in 1959 in Chennai All India Radio when Dave Brubeck visited with uh, Joe Morallo. He was visiting India in 1959. So my master, the great legendary Mridanga Maestro Parani Subramanya Pillai received a phone call from All India Radio saying that the great musicians from uh, America have come here. They want to listen to you. Would you please bring your drum and perform for them? And in turn, they would also like to perform for you. So without hesitation, my guru went and started playing. At that time, there was no idea of what jazz, jazz was all about. And uh, without realizing, my master started you know, playing along with Joe Morano. It was a fantastic program. And uh, All India Radio recorded that performance and broadcast it as When the Brudangam Played Jazz. Still, I think it's available on YouTube. People can watch that. And then later on, after coming to Canada, <clears throat> I used to be featured at the Percussive Art Society Convention in their regular annual series. And I was there. I can't remember the exact place where I was. This was in the US. And uh, the day before, Joe Morallo was giving a clinic, which I attended. He was a fantastic musician who could do multiple rhythms at the same time. And it was a great, great clinic. I wanted to go see him and pay my respect to him. And I uh, asked him about the incident that if he remembered the time that he played with my master. And you know what he said? Oh, Paralis are playing. He really made me sit at the practicing pad and get prepared to face him. So that's exactly what he, he told me. That's one thing. Here <clears throat> in Toronto, I had the opportunities to, first of all, to perform with uh, musicians in our jazz program. Because we, in, in, in our department, we had jazz studies, jazz program also. And I have had the chance to perform uh, uh, with the with the world drums ensemble, uh, there whereby you know where I, I played with the people greats like uh, Steve Gadd, uh, uh, of course later on with uh, Steve Smith, and also I have played with Ed Thickpen and and others. So in the process through my collaborations, I came to know a lot of things. It's not just from the book, you know, that I wanted to see what are the similarities, what are the differences, but. <clears throat> To put it in a concise manner, I would say there are many common elements, particularly jazz. You can see the improvisation is, is at the heart of jazz. And same is true with our Indian music, both South Indian classical and Hindustani music, North Indian classical music. We, we improvise a lot. We improvise on the raga. We improvise you know, with our drum patterns in Taniyavartram, in Mridangam solos, and, and, and whatnot. So improvisation is at the core. And many progressive jazz musicians have been seeking new rules for their trade. And we come across you know, in the history that how uh, John Coltrane and Miles Davis have adapted some of the Indian modes in, the, in, their, in their structure. So they were also looking for new kinds of form. So that's there you can see some kind of a similarity. And then there is the call and response idea like the trading of patterns. 
which you find you know in our talavadya program say between mridangam player gatam kanjira morching player you know we have that and we have also have had jugal bandis i myself have had the honor of performing with uh, uh, ustad uh, vilayat khan with the pandit shanta prasad that was my first program in chennai that happened in 1970 and then later on i had the honor of uh, you know performing with uh, the great uh, zakir hussain and uh, swapan choudhury and uh, there's another element you know they have also collaborated with a number of jazz musicians so you can really look for kind of you know improvisation form and this kind of call and response idea and these are the things um so this so we have that common ground of you know rhythm being central to everything that is i'm talking from the rhythmic point of view okay and we have exchanged a lot of patterns and uh, uh, over the years you know indian music has influenced generations of students not only students but also performers who have incorporated these ideas into their play because now it's very common if you happen to hear a mora or a korvai played on the drum set or by other musicians for that matter sir do you think that uh, your collaborations with uh, the non indian players of uh, different musics have led to a global audience being able to understand and come closer to our indian music and i think you already mentioned that a lot of it is happening but do you think that this is a reason why they been able to understand or come together and uh, know more about our uh, music is it because of the collaboration that is one type i would say i look at the indian influence on global music at least from three or four different perspectives one is at the educational level what i have been doing through york university as a professor of music imparting knowledge about indian music and i remember you know for each and every concert that was happening in toronto because there are many music associations bharati kala mandram doing south indian music and then there are other associations promoting hindustani music and then there is small, small world music so many organizations promoting our our music not only just indian music but world music in general so that's one way of so i used to prepare my students as to how to listen to what to listen for in indian music that kind of thing so that that the, at the educational level and um, this kind of you know collaborations have really you know enriched our tradition the way i take it is that, you know like i in the process i learned a lot too and this way i think you know we have created a global audience you know for our musics so indian music is heard in different contexts so to speak i have collaborated with the western classical chamber music with uh, with other small world music ensembles and as i mentioned you know like uh, uh, even like jugal bandis between mridangam and tabla and um, and uh, even going back to the educational level uh, what i have done is uh, to give them an awareness of our rhythms because the world knows that how intricate we get with the indian rhythms how complicated it could be i have written many articles on the subject and i have also produced two textbooks one is the rhythmic principles and practice of south indian drumming and the other the art of konako so people i have when when i said you know i kind of modified the system i With, through my innovation i created a solkattu course at york university where each and every student can can learn this soon it made an, such an impact that they gave up counting in numbers or one yanda two yanda three yanda they started counting in taka dimi taka jonu taka dimi taka jonu that was the first step and then through the medium of solkattu i introduced number of exercises etudes study pieces and compositions like amoras and corvais and i am glad to see that uh, it's so gratifying to see over the years the system that i created some 40 years ago has taken roots in the educational system in canada at the from the elementary to the most advanced levels in the elementary schools in in high schools and also at the college level 
So what I'm saying is like, you know, through the medium of education and then through the medium of research, because I, I was also teaching in the graduate program where I have encouraged, you know, people like uh, uh, Justin, you know, who, who has been in my courses and who has done a research paper on comparing, you know, the Indian music with, uh, with the other traditions. And people like uh, Ed Hanley, who has been studying, uh, you know, practicing uh, tabla, he has studied under great masters and he has studied South Indian rhythms as well. And this has also led to creating new compositions. I have created many compositions and many of my students have become educators and composers themselves. And this is how we create the global audience. Not just, to, of course, collaboration is one thing, but you can really look at from all these, from all these perspectives. So just a quick uh, last question to you. Along with the music, have, uh, have you been able to, or have they imbibed any knowledge of our heritage and culture? I know you run uh, Ragraj Utswam there. Uh, at that time, uh, is the audience only Indians or do we have a non-Indian audience there? Do they understand our, uh, what our idea of uh, classical music is? Oh, definitely. Because even at York University, besides performance courses, I was teaching a lecture course on the music of India, where I talked about the culture, understanding culture through music and other art forms like Bharatanatyam and other types of dances, because it's really a comprehensive uh, uh, course, which really opens the eyes, you know, for people to really understand what the Indian culture was all about. In that process, you know, I also, you know, researched myself and have learned many things about Hindustani music because I used to teach like I spend one semester on South Indian music and another semester on North Indian music. So people have been, you know, trained that way, you know, through the, through the, through the curriculum. And uh, I started the Thagraja festival longing for such a tradition because first when I came to Canada, I was homesick. I was, I was feeling lonely. And uh, even my family did not join me right away. They came back, came to Toronto only after a couple of months. Then at the suggestion, at my suggestion, uh, you know, uh, we organized a festival at my friend's basement with the 50 people taking part, including John Higgins and Lakshmi Ranganathan Veena player and a few others at that time. And uh, even I involved some of my, uh, you know, the students and the colleagues like KC Sokal to take part in that. And that was a humble beginning that I started in 1972. Then I brought it to the Bharati Kalamandram and involved the university and it has be become a regular feature now. And now we are getting about a thousand people for this festival. It has grown in, in, in large size. Thank you so much, sir, Thank for you. your uh, sharing your uh, wisdom as well as your experiences over the years. Thank you. It's my uh, pleasure. Uh, we would like to welcome Ed Hanley. He's a multi-dimensional artist. Uh, with who produces mind-blowing videos and he's learned both Carnatic as well as Hindustani music. I had the privilege of seeing uh, his beautiful video produced during lockdown and uh, uh, Ed, uh, could I request you to play a short clip from Monsoon? Sure, yeah, I'll play a little bit. And a maybe talk of... a little about it also. For sure, yeah. So the film is called Mushroom. Um, I made it during lockdown. It's about 31 minutes long and it's music, video, um, sound design, uh, dance and documentary. So I try to cover a whole bunch of stuff. And the section I'm going to play is from um, the, the part two of the film, which is a tabla tarang. And the video portion is, uh, I called it a virtual tabla museum. So basically I did high definition photography of all the tabla that you see behind me in my apartment uh, with three point lighting and video and all sorts of stuff. So I'll play a short clip of that. Um, uh, one moment. Okay.
Sorry, this seems to be stuttering. And I'll stop it there. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, a, a lot of uh, rhythm today, Ed, seems to be dictated and controlled by time. And that is time external to us, like the metronome. And mm. um, it's, it's, you know, have we become slaves to technology since you, you are involved uh, so much with technology? And, uh, <laughs> In, in your experience, do you think that Indian music in some ways helps to create an innate sense of rhythm where we can keep away from these uh, gadgets? Yeah, the, the, the to metronome or not to metronome question is a good one because I think, um, you know, the metronome has a, has a use uh, and, a, and a function and can be useful at certain times of your studies. And then also as a specific sort of um, sort of a tool if you're if you're working on something. So, but the problem if you only play with the metronome is that you never actually internalize the the be, you're not able to generate the rhythm yourself. You're always leaning on it, you know. And it's like a pole on the bus, and if somebody suddenly took the pole away, you would fall over. So it can be good to get an idea if you need to sort of how does this actually work? The metronome can be helpful, uh, but also so can walking. When you walk, you take regular steps. So if you go for a walk and recite a tabla composition or a corvai or something, you're not gonna change the tala of your walking because you'd stumble and fall over. So walking can be sort of a metronome. But I think it's important to internalize it. Um, a lot of music these days, a lot of sort of popular music is very much on a, on a grid, um, metronomic. So I think I'm a bit worried that people are, are going to lose touch with what organic time and feel feels like. And that's one thing that um, I really love about Indian music is that there's a real give and take and ebb and flow. And, uh, you know, I was talking to Justin uh, when we recorded uh, music for my film, of course, we had to do it all in social distancing. So I sent him the track and he played bass on it. And we did an interview after that I haven't published yet, but I will. And he was saying, you know, when two musicians are in the room together, if let's say Justin is playing with me and I'm playing a little, a tabla solo and I sort of tick the speed up just a little bit, within half a beat or a quarter of the beat, he will have adjusted to me. But if, if his part is pre-recorded on a metronome and I speed up, then immediately I'm out of time. So there's this incredibly rich micro give and take 
between musicians that's part of the live music experience that is just different in the recorded world. Just uh, add uh, another question for you. How do you think uh, learning differs, uh, you know, from when you do it with a guru personally, or uh, you learn in a university, or you learn on your own? What is the uh, preferential uh, way of learning that you feel is good for you? Hmm. Well, I've never learned in a university, so I can't speak to that. Um, I studied, I've studied sort of one-on-one -on -one or in group classes with uh, various um, uh, masters of Indian music uh, over the years. I prefer that way. I like to learn by ear. Um, uh, I think the group class can be useful because uh, if you're if you're running if you're playing material over and over again, having the force of twenty or thirty people playing it with you can be a big motivator. Um, but also, the one-on-one -on -one class is a very personalized, individual uh, type of class. Um, I teach uh, a workshop for young kids at the Toronto District School Board, where I teach them. Um, sort of Indian rhythm and drumming on a very basic level. And I have them compose their own Solka two phrases, learn how to say them with Tala, and then they play Dolak and Kanjira and make a groove and stuff like that. And that works very well as a group class because it's collaborative. I try to get everyone involved and everyone creating. Thank you, Ed. Uh, we would like to welcome Justin Gray. And uh, Justin uh, is going to showcase a new uh, instrument, and which is uh, probably the product of an unlikely uh, uh, pair duo, one from the world of uh, Indian classical music and one from the aggressive world of uh, metal. So Justin, could you tell us a little about the instrument? Absolutely. First of all, uh, hello to everybody. Pranam to Professor Sankran. Um, as he mentioned, he was actually one of the one of the first uh, people to introduce me and bring me into the beautiful world of Indian classical music studies here in Toronto. Um, I do have uh, Indian in my background on my mom's side, but I grew up as a jazz musician, and then so it was with Professor Sankran's great help and guidance and and uh, tutelage that I was sort of introduced to it so such a pleasure to see him as always and to my good friend Ed who has taught me so much about music and I've had the pleasure of uh, to be honest this instrument you know is very much related to a period of time where I, I you know became friends with Ed and started to make music together um, this instrument is uh, a product of the music and not the other way around. And what I mean by that is I moved to Calcutta uh, when I was just finished my university studies, my bachelor degree, uh, which was in a jazz program. In the middle of that program, actually at great inspiration from both Professor Sankran and another colleague of mine named Ravi Nayampali, who's a beautiful tabla player in Toronto, uh, I was encouraged along with two of my close friends, my guru bhais, Jonathan and Andrew Kay, to travel to Calcutta and uh, where we began studying with my Guruji, uh, Pandit Shantanu Bhattacharya. He's um, uh, uh, Indian classical vocalist uh, in the North Indian Hindustani tradition uh, in the Patiala Garana. And during my initial years of studying the music, he, as I mentioned, he's a vocalist. So we would study the music vocally, which is the best way to connect with the raga music. And at that time, I was playing a normal uh, electric bass in the sense that, that a, a bass instrument with frets uses an amplifier uh, because that's, that was my instrument. But over the years of studying the music, I was drawn towards instruments like the sarod and the sitag, um, and more specifically, the rudravina, which is uh, the drupad sort of predecessor to sitar and surbahar. Uh, and the sounds of the instruments, but also what the instruments could express in the music. The ability to bring the vocalizations of the music alive to such a degree uh, through things like, you know, the mind in the music and uh, the specific shruti positions and, you know, the true essence of what the, you know, again, those instruments as well were born out of vocal music. They were born and, and developed uh, 
further, especially something like the Rudravina in the Drupad tradition, initially begins as a single stringed instrument and eventually continues to develop to be able to express more and more of the music as, as the instrumentalists got more and more uh, adept at playing. And um, also the instrument makers became better. So at that time, I decided to design something. I had the encouragement to potentially learn an instrument like sarod, which is very dear to me, and uh, because the, it does have bear a lot of similarities with having a fretless fretboard. But I did also want to stay uh, honest to myself and my roots as a bass player, as as someone who learned the bass and spent my whole life to that time playing bass. So, with my Guruji's guidance as well as the guidance and friendship of the individual who built this instrument, whose name is Les Godfrey, who's a luthier here in Canada, actually. Uh, I began drawing and researching what is the minimum requirement to expand the bass instrument, the fretless bass, to be more suitable for performing Indian classical music. And that is what gave birth to the bass vena. Now, you did mention metal music, and although the bass is used in metal music, in all reality, the, the electric bass at its onset was created for R&B and rock and roll music, um, and has probably become most famous as an improvising instrument through jazz. So I see it, you know, I see it in my own light as a, as a, as a jazz-based instrument. And so the bass vena is just that, it's bringing the electric bass, specifically the fretless electric bass, because it has a fretless fretboard, and bringing it to a level where the sound, most important, the sound, uh, the aesthetics are you know, pretty as so many instruments are, but really it's about the sound um, and the ability, to, the ability to express. Now, once the instrument is created, then it's been my lifelong responsibility to learn how to express those things. Uh, with guidance from my Guruji and also all the musicians in the in the community around me, but um, so hopefully that answers the first part of your question. Thank you. Could you please play something so that we can relate to the kind of music you're talking about? Of course. So, although I do and, uh, play, sorry, Justin, your volume is a little low. Could we? Okay, yes, yeah, because I I had put it a, a little further away so you could see the whole okay. instrument. Uh, oh, the, thank you. I think the amplifier will make it loud enough when I'm playing. It's a Thanks. little bit better. Yeah, it is. It is. Thanks. So uh, I do play a lot of contemporary music, uh, fusion music, combining jazz and Indian music, or even other uh, contemporary sort of Western musical forms, um, combining them and also just taking inspiration from each other. But I think when we're discussing, you know, for today's uh, uh, presentation, going to the root of what the Hindustani veena and, you know, there is also the, the South Indian veenas, which would even are predecessors to those veenas, but it's important that to understand that this is inspired in the Hindustani tradition, uh, because actually the Rudra veena and, and North Indian instruments take just as much uh, influence from sort of the Persian influences. Um, and so I'm going, I'd like to perform a very, very short alab jord, uh, Alab Jor, maybe tiny, tiny Jala. I'll try to keep it to the Ravi Shankar length, uh, the five minute, <laughs> six minute length, not the, uh, not the full length that the Raga deserves. But uh, let's, uh, if anyone else should be playing more, it should be Professor Sankaran today. So, um, so an Alab Jor Jala, for those of you who know, is really the, you know, the art of unveiling the Raga and really the dearest tradition to the, to the, to the Veena. Now, of course, we also have Ragam Tanam Pallavi in the South Indian tradition, and Professor Sankran actually facilitated a study of the comparison. But for today, uh, for the Hindustani Veena, which has been the inspiration for this instrument, a short Alap Georgiala uh, in Rag Bhairav, because it's what, 9.45? It's, uh, it's getting a little late, but I'm, I already tuned the taraf, so let's just go for it. volume okay for you? Yeah, it sounds good. Thanks.
Thank you so much, uh, Justin. That was really beautiful. Uh, now we'd like to welcome Sri Aditya Verma. He is an Indian classical musician and a renowned artist on Canada's world music stage. Growing up in Montreal in a family deeply involved in Indian culture, he started playing the tabla at an early age under the guidance of his father, Sri Narendra Verma, and tabla wizard, Sri Zakir Hussain. Everyone, everyone knows about the sitar and how it became the most visible Indian instrument followed by the tabla. Sri Aditya, I'd like to ask you a question. How do you think Ustad Ali Akbar Khan did the same for the sarod? Uh, first of all, can you all hear me okay? Yes. In Namaskar, everybody. Um, <clears throat> uh, Khan Saab, uh, was essentially one of the first Indian classical musicians from the North who came to the States and outside of India, in fact, to perform. So there was essentially uh, two, uh, two figures um, who were both virtuoso, uh, Ali Prakhan Sahib and Pandit Ravi Shankar, who started propagating the music of North India uh, in, in Canada, United States, and all over Europe. And Khan Sahib, when he first uh, came here, it was in 1955, and he performed on television. He did a number of recordings. Um, and more, more importantly, anything else, in 1967, when he finally settled down in California, he established the Olympic College of Music. Um, it became a bit of an epicenter uh, for Indian music uh, in North America. And according to uh, the Olympic College, I think more than 10,000 students have walked in to its doors um, and they've learned music. They've become extraordinarily gifted musicians who also uh, uh, performed in music, learning from Kansab and the number of teachers who actually performed there and, and stayed there and teaching them there as well. So it was almost like a lifelong service which uh, Alibra Kansab did for the music of India 
and to, to spread this message from his father and from this Gharana, the Mahir Gharana, towards uh, the West, basically, at that time. Thank you, Aditya Ji. And uh, you performed with the uh, Washington uh, Symphony Orchestra and also produced Dharani Earth with uh, 30 musicians from all over the world. So yes. could you please uh, tell us about, uh, sorry, my videos. Could you please tell us about uh, what is it about the tonality of the Sarod, uh, which appeals to non-Indian listeners and your journey in these productions and taking this instrument on the world? Well, I'm, I'm biased towards the Sarod. So I say the Sarod works for everything. <laughs> it just has an extraordinary sound. It's, it's perhaps, uh, um, it's an extraordinary instrument that it's, it's, it has a very deep resonant sound, first of all. And there's a, uh, an extraordinary amount of glissando and harmonics in the instrument. Even after you finish playing the note, when you, when you slide your finger along to play a note, you lift it off, you go to the next note. It's a very deep, rich sound. And my experience has been, whether it's performing in India, or performing outside of India, Europe, or here in the States and Canada, um, that it's not just a matter of the instrument relaxing people or making them feel um, meditated at all. In fact, um, you can embody all the different Navarasas, whether it's um, the, the energetic aspect of it or the, the peaceful aspect of it, um, and uh, explain all these through the music. And especially when you're, you're using the rhythmic aspects of the music as well, they interact and people are automatically drawn to the energy of it. And they, they, just, they just love the music, the way it sounds. And it, it sounds like, you, on one hand, you have the sitar, for example, the most popular instrument from the north, which has almost like a female sound to it. It's much thinner. It's, it's, uh, it, it's uh, the, the, the kind of quality, of the, the timbre of the sound uh, for the sitar is, is lighter. It's also beautiful in its own way, but the sarod is almost like the male counterpart to that. It's, it has a much deeper sound to it and a much more resonant kind of sound. So that, a lot of people find that very uh, attractive to them as well. Does that, that make sense to you? That, that explains it. it. It's hard to, to explain a sound and why one sound as opposed to another sound uh, can attract people, but it's, it's a very, very beautiful sound. I think that's the most important thing. And as Justin was mentioning before, that you know, he, he, he likes the instrument very much and there's certain elements of, of his playing, even which I can see he uses different subtle techniques basically for the sliding as well. Thank you so much, uh, Aditya. Just one more question. Uh, we, I was talking to someone who uh, conducts uh, Veena concerts in Chicago, and she mentioned that for 20 years, there were no Veenas in Chicago because of the weather. So I think Canada uh, probably is even you know, uh, more harsh to instruments uh, from India. How, how, do, how do you all manage the upkeep? And well, you know, when I was, uh, when I was touring regularly in, in India and traveling to India every year, to perform, uh, <clears throat> I actually used to change my sarod skin uh, on the on the bottom part here of the sarod, the, the skin here, much more frequently because, as any skin like the tabla skin, for example, as well, it uh, it, it uh, soaks in the humidity, uh, it stretches, it becomes uh, almost thick. It, it seems like after uh, after a number of years. In India, just going back and forth to the dryness, to the humidity, the heat, the, the change of temperature between Canada and India as well. In Canada, I haven't faced that much of a problem because we're inside most of the time with our instruments. And the temperature is, is relatively well controlled uh, inside our homes. Most people keep their homes or cool their homes to a certain degree uh, in, in the summer. Uh, of course, when the weather is a little drier, when the, when the weather is not too cold, uh, the instrument really speaks its voice and it ends up becoming more resonant at that time. But otherwise, the maintenance has not been much of a problem here. Um, I would love if there was a, a good luthier here uh, who was skilled in changing Sarod skins, but uh, that's not likely to happen anytime soon. Akka? Vijayalakshmiji? Yes. Uh, are there any questions, uh, Varsha? I do see two questions here. Yeah, there are two questions uh, for all the panelists. So the, uh, there's one question which says, um, what is the most difficult part of improvising with musicians from different cultures? 
conversely what is the most rewarding aspect uh, anyone can answer this question i think we'll ask uh, uh, shankaran sir to answer that question Huh? Shankar sir, sir? You unmute your uh, audio. Okay. Uh, yeah, I wanted to hear the question one more time. It says, "What is the most difficult part of improvising with musicians from different cultures? Conversely, what is the most rewarding aspect?" Well, probably I can narrate through one of my own experiences. when i was featured with an african drummer a famous drummer abraham adzenia as part of the world drums um this was directed by john wire here of the nexus group um we were uh, taking solos and um, in african culture there is no such thing as coming back to sum the first beat in the tala cycle as we know that happens in carnatic tradition as well as in the hindustani tradition so during our improvisation i was when i was playing with him i wanted to search for some very some very some then i said to myself forget some just to go with the flow and that that one <laughs> that, that performance <laughs> so the rewarding thing was when we were when we came together you know right on the beat that was the most rewarding thing and the like this there are many challenges performing with the, with the different traditions different musicians and the same thing with the with the gamelan music that i have composed many works for gamelan and there too you know like how they take it like in gradual acceleration gradual speeding up is part of the tradition there and then also you know slowing down in the end and, and then ending with a with a big gong striking at the end of the composition and this is quite, this is kind of you know quite new to our tradition but in you know where well, you know you really you can really learn to adapt yourself and and go with the flow of the of the music and when we learn to really come together and when we are able to answer each other that's the most rewarding thing arnab do you have any questions uh i was just wondering if uh, any one of you has worked in the area of um, music therapy and indian uh, music i mean um, is has any one of you explored how music can help uh, uh, deal with any kind of uh, issues in a either with children or with adults this is open to all of um i am not a, i'm not a music therapist but i have a good friend who is uh i also one of my good uh close guru bhai's andrew k is someone who's been exploring uh not in a formal music therapy setting but of of using aspects of of raga music for this purpose so i've been more associated with it but i i as a music um uh, producer and engineer i was actually a part of a project last year of creating six records of different world music inspirations i wouldn't say cultures because it's not traditional music um but each album was focused on a different uh sort of continental music so indian music of course was one of those and it was a uh, a collection of cd's designed for palliative care settings and so through this process i did um initiate quite a few conversations with doctors and uh music therapists in terms of what they needed in the music the 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 thing that comes to mind is learning more about it is that deep listening and the art of having people focus on on music is really one of the key elements to um the success of the music therapy as well as of course there's so many other technicalities and these people are trained highly for for the art that they're um they're doing but the idea of deep listening the idea of focus and the i i think that what is built into indian classical music the idea for instance of professor shankar suggest, suggesting the sum or the you know the having sa and our our drone based um environment it does have a a sense of um a very grounded sense to it that oftentimes uh, aditya ji did mention the idea of you know people say it sounds meditative or it's often um 
those two words go hand in hand often in the description of Indian music. Oh, it's so meditative, but really through this looking at it and why it, it's that aspect of, of the drone, the aspect of the cyclic nature of the rhythmic cycles, the cyclic natures of, of the melodies, um, the thematic nature of raga music, uh, as, and I think also the sentiment in which the music is created with a, with a sense of space, a sense of um, the goal of, of creating the different rasas that are there, not all of which are meant to be calm, but some of which may be. Uh, and so I think that there's just a lot of elements that are built into the music naturally. Rather than them serving music therapy, it's like this is the original music therapy, or at least one of them. Uh, and so when people become connected to the music, they find what they're looking for automatically just due to the nature of how the music has developed, if that makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question. Uh, in Canada, is uh, Indian music a part of the school curriculum also, or is it only that they choose and they do it in college? So Shankaran, sir, you were mentioning something about uh, school. I think so, yes. The School Board of Education uh, has encouraged, uh, you know, world music. And as part of it, you know, Indian rhythm, you know, uh, has been uh, taught uh, at, the, at the school level, yes. So has anybody noticed that when they do, uh, especially with rhythm, that uh, it helps them with their maths? Of course, yes. People have invariably mentioned that to me. And uh, just to, to, to connect to the earlier part, uh, you know, I'm not a therapist either, but uh, I have had uh, some experience, of course, and I have performed in many yoga centers. Um, one of my earlier experiments at New York was with the electronic music, with the Moog synthesizer. And uh, the, the Tai Chi dancer was connected uh, through electrodes to the synthesizer. And in the meditative state, I'm, I'm told that uh, the brain can produce more alpha waves, which is very conducive to meditation. And so it was kind of a mixture of uh, different cultures. And uh, my task was to find out the, uh, the undercurrent rhythm of all these random patterns that were coming through the synthesizer as the Tai Chi dance was progressing. So I had that unique experience. Uh, so it turned out to be a nice performance. And also I'm told that, that those who are deeply involved with rhythm, they don't normally get Alzheimer. I think you know, the rhythm has to do with that, I guess. I do not know much about that. <laughs> Aparna, any questions? Uh, that's, that's it. Thank you. Uh, is there anything anybody would like to add? Ed or uh, uh, Varma ji, Aditya? Ji, batayye. Tell me. Um, I, I think that it's, it's, it's wonderful to have such diverse musicians uh, just in this panel to be able to speak about their own experiences. Somebody as esteemed as Dishi ji, uh, somebody with such a variety of experiences, Ed, uh, Justin, who I've been hearing wonderful things about, but the first time we're meeting beyond the, the borders of Facebook. And of course, to all of you to bring these together and to Arvind to, 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 to pose this, uh, this, uh, this panel as well. Um, my experience has been that from the time that I started learning as a young child, when I was three or four years old from my father, and I started off with tabla uh, to the point where I went to India to live with Pandiji, uh, Guruji uh, Ravi Shankarji in uh, 87. It was not part of the, the curriculum here in the sense that people didn't know about very much about Indian music. They knew something, uh, but the surge that had happened during the 70s and the early 80s was not as commonplace. And the people who were continuing their, their research into the music, the listening to the music, where people actually had much more serious interest. And their intent, as Justin was saying before, to listen deeply with, with some sort of focus, uh, with some sort of understanding, they were hungry for that. And I think that that's something which is continuing to this day uh, in Canada, whether you're in a school or you're in a performance and just a few words of giving some context to people to understand the music really uh, opens their vision and their ears to how to be able to appreciate this music. And they experience, you know, various forms in different ragas, the different rasas, so on and so forth. But it, it's really something which I think people are thirsting for more and more. Uh, I think the people's uh, appetite has grown and people's plates have become full with media 
uh, in the last three months with the pandemic, and they've had you know an opportunity to listen to some really interesting music from all around the world. There's a lot of uh, interplay between cultures as well, using something as simple as as a metronome or a click track to try to find ways of bringing the music together. But it's it's really something where everything is opening up, and let's see where the music goes uh, when the stage doors open up again and the concert halls are full again. Uh, I really th like to thank all of you. I mean, it's been wonderful. People from so many different backgrounds all coming together. I mean, it would have been wonderful if, could have, if you could all play it together. But uh, I know in Zoom, there's always this time lag and that's not going to work. Latency, yeah. Yeah. So I really look forward to interacting with all of you again. And uh, I'm sure Aparna will be sending out uh, questionnaires to all of you. And we'd be really happy if you could actually turn around and reply on that. And we really would like to thank Arvind for, uh, you know, helping us connect with all of you and, uh, you know, helping us put this together. And uh, we thank the Indian High Commission that's also uh, uh, streaming this live on their uh, Facebook. And uh, thank everybody. And it's, it's been a wonderful, uh, you know, one and a half hours. I hardly realized the time going by. And uh, we, really, we really look forward to uh, engaging with all of you again. Thank you so much and Namaskar. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.